Would you turn back to Ephesians chapter 5? Verse 18. And be not drunk, intoxicated with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. I've entitled this message, Be Filled with the Spirit. Now, what in the world does that mean? I hope by the end of this message we'll have some kind of understanding of this. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, filled is in the present tense, a little grammar here, and I think it'll help us to understand this. Filled is in the present tense. It's not something that happened in the past. It's not something we look back to. Be filled. And it's in the passive voice. You're not filling yourself. Be filled. Literally, be being filled. Not you were filled. Not you fill yourself. But be filled. Being filled with the Spirit of God. This is not a one-time event. It's the continual action of the believer. It's not the action of the believer. He's the subject of what God the Holy Spirit does. Be being filled with the Spirit of God. Now who is this Spirit of whom Paul says... Be ye not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. He's speaking of the Spirit of God. Now this is unique to the gospel. Um, It's beyond comprehension. can only be believed. Not understood, but believed. But God, the living God. The one God, there's only one God. The one God is revealed in three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God in three distinct persons. Now, do I understand that? No. Do I believe it? Yes, because it's what the Bible reveals concerning God. Now, let me remind you, the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. And the only way we can know the character of God, the only way we can know God, the only way we can know what God is like is through this book called the Bible. And the Bible reveals that God is one God in three distinct ways. Persons. Now, you remember when the Lord was teaching us about baptism, and He said, Baptize, when you baptize, baptize everyone in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Godhead. Now, when Peter confronted Ananias about his lying, He said, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? You can read this in Acts chapter 5. Why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? You've not lied unto men, but unto God. God, the Holy Spirit. He's God, co-eternal, co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. God is one God revealed in three distinct persons. God the Holy Spirit is not a force. He's not an influence. He's a person. God the Holy Spirit. He's first mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where we read that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It was he who came upon the Virgin Mary and caused her to conceive. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when the eternal son was made flesh. He said, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. God, the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary and caused her to be with child, the son of God the uncreated, eternal Son of God. Unto us, a child is born. He was born in time, but unto us, a son is given. He wasn't born. He's the eternal Son of God. And it was God the Holy Spirit who made Mary, the virgin, to conceive. And this is very important because somebody says, could a virgin have a baby? Yes. This time, because God the Holy Spirit caused her to. And no, it is impossible naturally, but if the Lord Jesus Christ was born of a man, he'd have a sinful nature like a man. But he was born of the Spirit of God. That's why he is sinless. He is like the Father and the Son. God the Holy Spirit, he's eternal. He never began to be. He Habits eternity with God the Father and God the Son. There was a time when there was no time. There was no creation. All there was was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit dwelling in unity. He's co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. He is God. He, like God, is sovereign. That means he always does his will. And no one can thwart him. No one can stop him from doing his will. You see, he's omnipotent. He has the power to make his will come to pass. The wind blows where it wills, our Lord says. You hear the sound thereof, and you can't tell whence it cometh or whether it goes. Even so is everyone that's born of the Spirit. He is omniscient. He knows everything. He's never learned anything. There's no new information to him. He's never been surprised. He's never had to say, I didn't know that. He never responds to anything because he controls everything. There's never a time when he has to respond. He's independent. How could he be independent? Because he's God. God has no needs. I think it is... Um, blasphemous when people talk about the creation of man. They say, well, God made man so he could, uh, like he needed something in man to, to fulfill some kind of perceived need in him. God's independent. He has no needs. God the Holy Spirit has no needs. God the Father has no needs. God the Son has no needs in that sense. They're utterly independent. He's immutable. He never changes all the attributes of God are in God the Holy Spirit because God the Holy Spirit's God. He's God. Just as much God as God the Father, just as much God as God the Son. And his activity is never separated from the person and work of Christ. Now let me repeat that. It's very important that you and I understand this. His activity is never separated separated from the person and work of Christ. His activity is never separated from the will of the Father. And when he speaks, he doesn't speak of himself. That's what he said. That's what God, the, the Lord Jesus said about him. He shall not speak of himself, but what he shall hear, that shall he speak. You see, a preacher who's always talking about God the Holy Spirit doesn't have God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit exalts the gospel. He exalts Jesus Christ. That is his purpose. And God the Holy Spirit never acts independently from the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love to think of this, the Trinity in unity. John said, these three, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, these three are one. This is one of those stuff, well, I, I feel this way. I, I reckon about it every time I preach, but I don't understand this. I just believe it. It's impossible to understand. I remember one time I was preaching somewhere, and somebody said, I understand the Trinity. I said, you do not. You do not. 
No one understands the Trinity, but we believe this because God has revealed it in his word. <clears throat> God the Holy Spirit is the author of the new birth. Just as he was the creator, when God said, let us make man in our own image, it's God the Father speaking, God the Son speaking, and God the Holy Spirit speaking. Let us make man in our own image. And he created the universe. And he's the author of the second creation, the new birth. Being born again is the work of God the Holy Spirit. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The creative work of God the Holy Spirit. You've been given a nature born of the Spirit that was not there before. It's being born of God. The Lord said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And it can never rise above that. Fallen flesh. Sinful flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The wind blowing where it will, speaking of the Spirit, giving life wherever he is pleased to give it. I think of what the Lord said in John chapter 6, verse 63. The flesh profits what? Nothing. In this thing of the new birth, in this thing of the salvation, how much does our natural flesh contribute? The flesh profits nothing. It is the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, that quickens, that gives life. Now, <clears throat> we read in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, where Paul said, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. There's election. God hath from the beginning, before time began, he chose you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. What is the evidence of someone being sanctified by the Spirit? They believe the truth. How does someone believe the truth? Because they've been sanctified by God the Holy Spirit, caused to do that. It can't be done apart from God the Holy Spirit. Now, the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, elects. Now, let me remind you what that means. That means if you're a Christian, if you're saved, it's because God chose you before time began to be saved. And saved you must be. God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, redeems. That's why he came to earth. He came to work out a righteousness that the elect could never perform. And he worked out a righteousness for them. And he redeemed them. He paid for their sins and made it to where I have no sin. And God the Holy Spirit is the one who gives life. He regenerates. He, he gives life that was not there before. Why do I believe the gospel? He gave me life. That's why. Why do I repent? He worked it in me. Why do I love God? Because he works it in me. That's the work of God the Holy Spirit. Now understand this. The work of all three persons of the Trinity are absolutely essential in the salvation of the sinner. You can't have salvation without election. You can't have salvation without Christ's successful redemption. And you can't have salvation without the saving power of the Holy Spirit giving you life. You must be born again. And this is essential. This is essential. God the Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture. I love that passage of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This book is the divine, inspired, inerrant word of God. And we have to have that because if we don't have that, all we have is my opinion and your opinion and what so-and-so thinks. What good is that going to do anybody? We must have this written revelation of which God, the Holy Spirit, is the author. He is the author of every word of this book. 
He's called the Spirit of Truth. He's called the Spirit of Christ. He's called the Spirit of Grace. He's called the Eternal Spirit. He's called the Spirit of God. He's called the Holy Spirit. He's called, and I love his name, the Comforter. The Comforter. And everything that you and I experience, the Holy Spirit is the author of. If you believe that faith didn't come from you, it comes from his work in you. If you have repentance, if you have a change of mind, it's because he changed your mind. If you love God, it's because he gave you that love. You were born of the Spirit and given a nature that you didn't have before he gave you this nature. He is the author of everything we experience. I love that passage where it says that it's, he, when he should come, he will convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, if you're ever convinced by the Spirit of God, you'll be convinced of sin. You know what that means? You'll be convinced you're a sinner. <clears throat> and the Lord gives this meaning. He says, a sin because they believe not on me. When you're convinced of the Holy Spirit, you're convinced that you're an unbeliever. And you can't come up with faith. You're completely dependent upon him to give it to you. You're convinced of righteousness. And he said, of righteousness because I go to my Father. You know that the only righteousness that there is is the one he presents to the Father. His righteousness as your righteousness before God. And you're convinced of judgment. He should convince the world of judgment, of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. You're convinced that all judgment has already taken place by what Christ accomplished on Calvary's tree. Now, what is the preaching of the gospel without the Holy Spirit? 1 Peter 1.12 says, speaks of those who have preached the gospel with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. Now, if I get up and preach as accurately and perfectly as I can from the scriptures, you know how much good it'll do? None. Unless God the Holy Spirit is pleased to bless me in preaching and you in hearing. The activity of the Holy Spirit takes place in the preaching of the gospel. <coughs> I like what uh, John said. 1 John 4, 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses <coughs> that Jesus Christ was before he came, he's eternal, he came in the flesh, and he did what he came to do. That is the preaching of God the Holy Spirit. Now, We also read in the scriptures that God the Holy Spirit, you can read this in Ephesians 1, 12 and 13, he's the earnest, that means the pledge of our salvation, and he's the seal, he's the mark of authentic being real, and he is the one who preserves us. And the believer is said to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. And that doesn't mean sometimes you're walking in the spirit and sometimes you're walking in the flesh. You walk in the Spirit when you continually look to Christ only as all you have in salvation. That's walking in the Spirit. Walking in the flesh is walking, thinking you can be saved by your works. And we read in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. What's liberty? Liberty is not owing anything and getting to do what you want to do. That's what liberty is. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. He's paid my debt. I don't owe anything. Right now I stand before God perfect, without debt, without sin, because Christ put it away. And I'm getting to do what I want to do. I'm meeting with God's people and hearing the gospel. That is the liberty that's in Christ Jesus. Now, what does Paul mean in verse 18? This is the spirit of which he is speaking of when he says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit of God. Be not drunk with wine. That's talking about intoxication. Drunkenness is sin, 
Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Peter calls it excess of riot. When the Lord uses this word, he's talking about the prodigal who went and wasted his substance in riotous living. That's what is meant when he says, be not drunk with wine wherein is it excess, which is riotous living, excess of riot. When you're drunken, and I think it's kind of unusual how all of a sudden he brings drunkenness in this statement uh, regarding God the Holy Spirit, but there's a point. When you're drunk, it affects everything about you. There's no part that's not affected. It affects your mind, it affects your emotions, it affects your body. There's no part that's not affected when you're drunken. Now that's the point he's making. Don't be that way, drunken with wine, but be filled with the Spirit of God that every aspect of your life is affected by the Spirit of God. And that's what this being filled with the Spirit means. Now sometimes the filling of the Spirit in the New Testament is speaking of the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. Remember when Paul was baptized, they laid hands on him and he received the Holy Spirit. And what that's talking about is in the early church, in the New Testament, they would lay their hands on you, only the apostles, nobody else, only the apostles could do this. They would lay their hands on you, and you would receive these supernatural gifts where you could speak in tongues. You could speak in other languages. I could go into Russia or Spain or France or Italy and preach the gospel, and they'd understand me because I'd be preaching in their language. I might not understand I'm doing it, but that's the way they hear it. That's what the gift of tongues is. And when I know in the charismatic movement they talk about this, this uh, heavenly language and this speaking in tongues. It's not real. It's phony. And if somebody claims to have these gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're phonies, and that's all they are. Don't, don't give them any credit. If they really had these gifts, they could go into other languages or under their countries and preach the gospel. They could pick up snakes, and they'd bite them, and it wouldn't hurt them. They could drink poison. It wouldn't hurt them. They could go into hospitals and start healing people. Somebody dying of cancer, they'd say be healed and they'd be healed if they had this gift. Now these fellows who claim to have this gift, why don't they do that? Because they don't have the gift. Because it's pure phoniness. The entire charismatic movement is phony. There is no truth to it. Don't be intimidated by it. I never will forget when I was, uh, when I was in college, I, I lived beside what was called the Maranatha Christian Fellowship. And all these fellows could speak in tongues and, and do all the, you know, they said, all these things they could do. And I was, and I, I remember I was intimidated by it. And I remember praying that I would receive the gifts because I didn't understand. And I thought, well, if the Bible says something about it. I, if, 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 it's, if it's real, I want to do it. And thank God it never happened. Thank God. Um, one, one, of my, one of the things that I, I remember a guy, there that looked like Charles Manson. He really did. He had the long hair and the beard and the piercing eyes. And, he's, and uh, he said, God gave me a revelation about you. I thought, what? He said, there's sin in your life. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, no. You know. Well, there we was sin in his life, you know. But, I mean, it's just, it just, all that stuff's phony. So this is not talking about, when it's talking about filling of the Spirit, it's not talking about all this charismatic garbage. And, I, and, and that's what it is. And, I, and somebody hears this and, and said, I, I, you know, I've, I've received a lot of letters over the years when I say something like that on TV or radio and people hear it and how you're, gonna sit, you're doing the sin against the Holy Spirit. I'm not worried a bit, a bit about that. This is not, the filling of the Spirit is not some kind of uh, experience like the charismatic movement. Uh, somebody says, well, how can you say that those gifts are over? Because Acts chapter 8 says when they, when they saw that the gift of the Spirit was given by the laying on of the apostles' hands. Now, the only ones who could transfer this gift were the apostles. When they died, you know what? The gift died too. That is scriptural. I, you, you know, people say, well, where can you find that in the scriptures? Well, I, I found it, Acts chapter 8. 
when they saw by the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given. And so this is not talking about what uh, the entire charismatic movement speaks of. It's not talking about that at all. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is regeneration. It's being born again. That's what that's a reference to. You must be born again. Um, regeneration. Uh, Billy Graham wrote a book entitled How to Be Born Again. The Bible never tells you how to be born again, but it tells you you must be born again. And this filling of the Spirit, this is not a how to be filled with the Spirit. I wouldn't dare try something like that. I wouldn't know how to tell somebody how to be filled with the Spirit, but I'd say be filled with the Spirit. Ask the Lord to cause you to be filled with the Spirit. We're going to look into that a little bit more. Um, the Lord taught us, turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Verse 11, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that's a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Well, of course not. If you then, being evil. Now he's talking to his disciples. How does that strike you? What if the Lord said to you, if you then, being evil, would you defend yourself? Or would you say, boy, he's got me down bad. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now, let me repeat. I'm not going to give a message about how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't know where to begin there, but I do know this. The Bible lets us know what it looks like when one is filled with the Holy Spirit. Turn back to our text in Ephesians chapter 5. Be being filled. Lord, cause me to be being filled with your Spirit. Now, what's it look like when someone is being filled? With the Spirit of God. Well, let me tell you, right off the bat, it doesn't mean you got a halo over your head. It doesn't mean that you are speaking in tongues or speaking in real pious language that is uh, seemingly insincere the way so many people do. It's not that at all. But back to our text in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourselves. Here's what happens when people are filled with the Spirit of God. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now it could be speaking to yourselves. Don't you love it when the Lord enables you to sing hymns and you're blessed by them when you're all by yourself? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, Psalm 23, hymns, spiritual songs. Um, singing is part of public worship. It's very important. When we're singing these hymns, don't just go through the motions. Sing, singing to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What a blessing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs are. Look in Colossians chapter 3. Turn a few pages over. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's what happens when people are being filled with the Spirit. The word of Christ dwells in them richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now that's what it looks like when someone's filled with the Spirit or being filled with the Spirit. They sing to themselves, they Sing to one another, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, 
When you're being filled with the Spirit, you want to be with the church. You want to meet with the people of God. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is part. You know, you can't serve the Lord by yourself. You can't do it. You can't. We're getting ready to take the Lord's table. You know, you can't take the Lord's table by yourself. So it says, I think I'm going to take the Lord's table. And, and, and you just sit there and say, well, that's ridiculous. You can't baptize yourself. I mean, there's things that can be done only through the church, speaking to one another. Fellowship in the gospel, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing. And I love this, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, when someone is being filled with the Spirit of God, they are rejoicing in the gospel. They're making melody in their heart to God. Aren't you thankful that salvation is utterly in Christ? Doesn't that make you happy? That everything God requires of you, he looks to Christ for? Does that make you happy? That his righteousness is your personal righteousness before God and you have nothing to fear? Doesn't that make you happy? That on judgment day, when your name is called, perfect! No sin to worry about. It's gone. Oh, the joy and peace of believing the gospel. You sing and make melody in your hearts to God. That's what being filled with the Spirit looks like. Look in verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father. That's You know what happens when someone is being filled with the Spirit of God? They're thankful. They're thankful for everything. In everything give thanks. I don't care what it is. I don't care how painful it is. It doesn't mean you're saying in a giddy way, but if the Lord strikes you with cancer tonight, and you find out about it, give thanks. It's for your good and His glory. Whatever it is. Um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 says, In everything give thanks. Whatever it is. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Everything God brings your way. I don't care how difficult it is. I don't care how joyous it is. It's Him that brought it. So give thanks. Thanks for it. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So I tell you, one evidence of the filling of the Spirit is you're thankful. You're thankful. Look what he says next. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you're filled with the Spirit, when you're being filled with the Spirit, you wouldn't dare approach God any other way but by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a deep awareness of that. You're not thinking about how joyful you are or your soul. You're thinking, I can't come into His presence except in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't come in my own name. I don't come in my works or my merits or anything about me. I come in the name of Christ. And I wouldn't dare come any other way giving thanks unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another. Now, when I'm being filled with the Spirit of God, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to submit to you. And you're going to submit to me. And we're all going to be subject one to another. Your great interest is the church of God. Submitting yourselves to one another. Not just seeking your own way and not caring about the church of God, but submitting to one another. And we do so in the fear of God. Oh, that fear that's the beginning of wisdom. Someone who is being filled with the Spirit is someone who fears God. Now, what's it mean to fear God? When you fear God, you're afraid to look anywhere but Christ only. That's the only true fear of God. If you think you can be saved by your works or if you can come into God's presence some other way than the name of Christ, you have no fear of God. You have no respect for God. You don't even know who he is. But if you're being filled with the Spirit of God, you will uh, be in the fear of God. Look what verse 22 says. This is part of being filled with the Spirit of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, somebody says, well, he doesn't deserve it. That's not the point. 
That's not the point. You do it in the fear of God. You do it because you want to, because you know that's what the Lord says for you to do. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. If you're being filled with the Spirit of God, you're going to be submissive to your husband for Christ's sake. That doesn't mean husband saying, you need to submit to me, all that. If you want to make sure they won't do that. Um, but I'm talking about doing this for Christ's sake because that's what you want to do. Look in verse 25. Here's what happens when people are being filled with the Spirit of God. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. When someone is being filled with the Spirit of God, you know what they want to do? They want to love their wives as Christ loved the church. They want to, they want to make their wives so thankful that they're married to them because of the way they treat them. Now that's what happens when someone is being filled with the Spirit of God. It's not some kind of warm feeling or, no, it's, it's seen in your conduct. Look in chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. If, if you're a child and you're a believer, you know what's going to evidence that you're going to, that you're being filled with the Spirit? You're going to honor your parents. You're going to honor authority. Adults honoring all authority. You're going to be respectful to authority if you're being filled with the Spirit of God. And that's the context of what he's saying. Look in verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If you're being filled with the Spirit, it's going to make you the parent you ought to be. It's going to make you seek to be the parent that Christ would have you to be, that he would cause you to be. You're going to want to raise your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Verse 5. When someone's being filled with the Spirit, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with, uh, with fear and trembling and singles of your heart as, un, um, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall receive of the Lord, whether it be bond or free. Now, if I'm being filled with the Spirit, it's going to make me seek to be the best employee that I can be. The best one there. If I'm being filled with the Spirit. You know, I have no doubt that if the Lord Jesus Christ was employed by somebody, he'd, have to, he'd be the best employee they have. He'd be the most faithful. He'd be the hardest working. He would, uh, and that's what it is to be Filled with the Spirit of God. I mean, in the context of what he's saying, this is what he's saying. He's not telling how to be filled with the Spirit, but he's sure enough showing us what it looks like. Look in verse 9. Ye masters, do the same things unto them, for bearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is the respective persons with him. If someone is being, fill, is being filled with the Spirit of God, it's going to make them a better employer, a better master, a better boss, where you're... The people under you are going to be thankful they work for you. They're going to think, what a blessing to have a man like this as my boss or a woman like this as my boss. This is part of being filled with the Spirit of God. It's going to, remember when he says, be not drunk with wine, where in every aspect of your life is controlled by that intoxication, but be being filled with the Spirit of God. It's going to make you, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We're going to get to that in a few weeks. But if you're being filled with the Spirit, you're going to put on the whole armor of God. Now, we, or preachers, have really messed this up by making the filling of the Spirit some kind of... Um, ooey-gooey, undefinable, uh, rushing feeling, and you start speaking in tongues and start to... No. The filling of the Spirit. Like I said, I'm not telling you how to be filled with the Spirit, and the Bible doesn't either, but it just says be, being filled with the Spirit. And being filled with the Spirit is manifest in every area of our life. Speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in our hearts to God, being thankful for everything. Only through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting ourselves to one another 
in the fear of God. B, being filled with the Spirit of God. And that's what I'm praying. I'm, you know, the Lord taught us to pray and ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit. I'm asking the, for the Holy Spirit that I might look to Christ only, that I might preach Him only, that I might glorify Him only. That is the office of the Holy Spirit. He says, He shall not speak of Himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He shall glorify me. That's what God the Holy Spirit does. He glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I think it's um, sobering to think of these two scriptures where it speaks of grieving the Holy Spirit. You can only grieve a person. And quenching the Holy Spirit. I know you've read that. Quench not the Spirit of God. Where you quench his influence. Now I realize that we can't make him leave. We don't want to. But we can certainly quench his influences in our life by, our own, by not looking to Christ. By looking to ourselves. By not glorifying him. May we... Be so filled continually, be being filled by the Spirit of God that we continually look to Christ only, preach Christ only, and that he would invade and empower every aspect of our life no matter what it is. I want you to remember this. There's nothing mundane in the life of a believer. Everything we do, we do as unto the Lord. Now, we're getting ready to observe the Lord's table. And what the Lord's table represents is the broken body and shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why was his body broken? Because he bore my sin. He bore the sins of his elect. Why was his blood shed? The soul that sinneth shall surely die. My sin became his sin so truly that he died. It was my sin given to him and became his sin. And he died for it. Understand this. When Christ was dying, he wasn't saying, I'm dying for Todd's sin. Todd's sin became his sin that he became guilty of. And that's why he died. And we're observing the Lord's table, the bread and the wine, and we remember, we celebrate, we rejoice that all of our salvation was accomplished by what he did on Calvary's tree. Let's pass out the bread and wine.